Hey, I'm Travis. And I'm Adele. And our channel is all about helping couples in all seasons of marriage walk through crisis and navigate the healing journey together as a couple. We hope you enjoy our channel and follow along this journey. Hey friends, welcome back to our channel. And today we are so excited to have some of our friends on our channel today sharing their story of brokenness to restoration. Welcome Brad and Lisa. Thank you guys so much yeah. for having us. Yeah, it's so good to have you here. Brad and Lisa Valencia, they come out of Texas. Oh, what a beautiful state. And they are with a company, Unrelenting Pursuit. Correct. And you guys are all about how to help other couples restore their marriages. And you have a powerful story yourself in your marriage. Mm. Oh, yeah. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for being on here. Thank you for letting us chat with you. I have over the last year or so, Adele and I have just talked to you guys a few times, seen you on Instagram, social media. And I'll tell you, I love what you're doing in trying to give other people hope in hopeless marriages. It's very powerful for me. And so it makes me curious, why do you do that? What is it about your story that you want to give other people hope and hopelessness? I think for, for me, though, it's like when people breathe hope over me during this period of time in our life and our story, and as hopeless as our story was, which we'll get into, but man, it was unbelievable what that did for me when people gave me some glimmer of hope, yeah. breathed life over me. And so it's just our entire intent is to give God glory in the middle of this because he is a God who sustains. And so it's such a beautiful picture of how he loves us. And that's mm. that's kind of why I'm in it for sure. Yeah, I think um, I've never been asked that question, actually, which is funny. We uh, like those been questions. doing this for a bit. <laughs> I'm in it because... I grew up in church and I've read and I've heard this story over and over again, but the parable of the prodigal son, and um, it's not logical. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not, you think about it and it's like, why, why leave, you know, the 99 to go after the one? It doesn't make sense until you're the one. Yeah. Until you're the one. <clears throat> so for me, um, like, I want to help as many marriages as possible. I want to show that no matter where you are in w running away from God, that he's right there next to you and he can grab you and, you know, just save you from it. So that's one big piece for me. Yeah. I, I see. Emotional when you get emotional. <laughs> I, that's what I was going to say is I see that really touched you. Did it touch you because you were able to go back and like really get present to that feeling and emotion? Yeah, I mean, it's just, that's the, that's the one, I mean, there's so many parables and, and, you know, history from the Bible that just hits me when you read it. But I don't think people truly understand the prodigal son or, you know, that parable or even, you know, the, the, you know, Jesus leaving the 99 to go after the one sheep, you know, or the shepherd doing that, all these things. Like, I don't think that people really grasp the gravity of that um, unless they're the one, all of us are the one. Right. We've all fallen short. We all are the one. But I mean, to the point of running away from God or ignoring God or whatever your beliefs are that you're in that dark place. Yeah. I don't think you fully grasp the the logic behind it, because there's not logic. It's it's God. Right. It's yeah. he's above all things. And so, yeah, just to think of it that way. And that's why those, you know, that really hits me. Mm -hmm. Um because if that wasn't true, then I wouldn't be right here. Wow. Yeah. Mm, that's powerful. So. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Brad. Yeah. It's, it's powerful <laughs> to hear where both of you have chosen to step outside of something, step outside of maybe comfort, and go into helping others. Because we're in the marriage ministry, too. It's not like it's comfortable to go and share some deep, dark things of your past and some wounds, but it really is healing to be able to see other people get healing that you've experienced in your life. And I imagine uh, that could be some of your emotions too there, Brad. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. But it, it's, just, it's just a, a passion and, mm -hmm. and it's hard for me, like when we help, when we've helped other couples or I've coached men on the side, or I'm just engaged with, with uh, different men and to hear, 
I get, I get passionate about all that because, you know, I, I hear or talk to the apathetic man, right? And then I hear and talk to the guy that doesn't really know what he's doing, but he wants this Jesus thing. And maybe while I'm talking to him, like, you know, every few often he's dropping like an F-bomb, um, but he's like trying to figure all this out, yeah. right? And then, but, and I, I gravitate towards that because it's, it, I get it. I get, I understand that the hunger and, and desire to know more. And, mm. and if you don't have that, like what's, what's driving you and they know that there's a piece missing the apathetic man really makes me passionate too, because it's like, how can you just sit there and ignore what's going on? Like I almost look at it as an, an arrogance of really, if you know anything about God and you're just sitting there doing nothing and you're just kind of going through life, like how arrogant is that? I don't even look at it as a laziness I just think of it as a side or some some level of of some kind of arrogance where you can just be kind of like, man, eh, whatever. Yeah. Um, so no, it just both those things make me passionate and and they both directly affect marriages. Um and and majority of the men that I talk to are married. And whether they have a, you know, quote unquote normal run of the mill marriage or they're having a marriage that's on the rocks or whatever it is, um, both those senses of or both those paths that these men are trying to take are affecting their marriage or affecting their parents or their childs are affecting everything in their life yeah good point so true there's like a ripple effect that keeps 100%. going on Absolutely. yeah so we would love to hear your story if you will share with us a little bit of your story and how you got to be where you are today yeah, absolutely. You want me to start it off and then hand it over to you like I normally do? Um, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll just give a really quick overview of the first 10 years of our marriage. Uh, we have been married for 22 years now. Uh, we have three beautiful kids, um, 17, 16, and 12. So we're in the definitely the teenage stage of parenting, which we're enjoying, actually. Yeah. Um, we want to breathe life over those of you who are raising teenagers. There is hope. Amen. <laughs> Yes. But um, our first 10 years of our marriage, we always like to say that we did not have a bad marriage. Um, we like to emphasize that because I think there is a common misconception that if you don't have a bad marriage, this could never, ever happen to you. So we had a what we would have considered a, quote, good marriage, quote, unquote. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't notice that there was any cracks in the foundation. We didn't realize that there were some you know, things that should be done differently or pursuing each other differently until everything imploded. So we were kind of just going along. I would say that we had established kind of a routine. We were fairly young parents at this point, had had our third, um, our yeah. just, just a baby at this point, and Brad was traveling a lot for work. And we kind of thought, I think, at least in my mind, this was an impossibility that we would ever face. I mean, an impossibility. Like when I say that this is something that never, ever, ever, ever would it enter my mind that this would be something that we would face, that was me. I, like I chose right. That's how I felt. Like I chose right. I had, you know, we had the boxes checked for, you know, okay, man of faith, you know, we're doing the things, we're going to church, you know, just there were various things that I had this level of, you know, false identity, I guess, in what I thought was really our reality and it wasn't. And so we like to start with that just so people realize like this is something that every every marriage needs to pay attention to. Um, you need to pay attention to the cracks and it's important. And then I hand it off to him and make him tell all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, just to clarify kind of, I mean, there was, we never really argued. Mm -hmm. We never really fought over anything. We didn't, that's just not our nature really. Um, so there wasn't any, I mean, there was cracks, like you're saying mm -hmm. uh, that maybe we can look back on now. I, I don't think of anything specific, but in the sense of, of, uh, consistently pursuing each other, my, what, what are our priority? Yeah. What's our, what's our priority in our marriage? All these things like that. And I don't think we've really ever talked about it before. Um, you know, before we got on this road, you know, that we're yeah. on now. <laughs> so like she said, it, we checked all the boxes. Um, we both grew up in church. I grew up in church uh, from the day I can remember I've been in church, um, had experiences with Christ. I don't think I fully had my personal walk with Christ, like rooted and grounded in, in you know, in what I believe. Not saying that what I believe is different from the Bible at all. It's not. It goes right along with what the Bible says. 
But instead of just taking the church word for it or my parents' words for it, is that actually me diving in and really studying and learning and, and seeking Christ. And I don't think I know now I didn't really ever have that. And so, you know, 10 years, 10 years, mm-hmm. 10 years into our marriage, I was traveling a lot for work and I just started making, you know, small compromises here and there in I think that's how it always works. It's never, you know, roll out of bed one day and say like, okay, I'm going to, you know, destroy my marriage, walk away from my family. I mean, there's, yeah, I don't think, I I, I would argue that there's nobody that's ever done that um, in their life. There's always something you can go back and start seeing like little things that are happening, happening and growing and growing, even if the spouse doesn't see that. And so, you know, I was traveling a lot for work, like she was saying, and, and I just started to, like examples would be, you know, going out and working and then at night going out and having dinner and maybe having a couple of drinks and then just going to bed. And then that kind of progressed a little bit further along, staying out a little bit later and then getting home. And now I'm looking at things that I shouldn't be looking at. So now porn's creeping into my life and then that keeps progressing and, you know, further along, further along, further along. And here is where if... Man, if you're a Christ follower and you think that the enemy is not after you 24-7, you're 100% wrong and you're you're setting yourself up for failure because he knows exactly how to get you specifically. Mm-hmm. Someone that could be listening to this could be like, I would never fall into that. And maybe that's not something you would fall into. But uh, for me, that's where he knew to hit me. And mm-hmm. so as this progressed, staying out later, um, you know, much later, right? Now I'm actually going out right? Partying, doing these things, but still never crossing the, you know, the, the line, right? The line that we all have in the sand of like, this is what adultery is. You know, it's not what I've been doing. That's not, you know, back, you know, when I was doing this, I was justifying everything I was doing. Right. And again, I grew up in church. This is something I knew enough of the Bible. I could kind of justify what I was doing, you know, and then I'd just, you know, just keep going. Right. Just, you know, feeding my flesh. But as I started going out more, then I started seeing getting attention from uh, women. And then as that progressed, and this is where I know the enemy just eats you up, because like for me, um, I have always had, and I still wrestle with insecurities, uh, you know, for whatever reason. Uh, when, you know, I don't know. I've never been to a therapist, and I'm not knocking therapists. They're awesome. I think yes, everyone, like, we therapist. tell people to go to therapy, to go to counseling, to seek counseling. But um, I never have, so I don't know where all this has come from. But I just have grown up with insecurities just that I've probably put on myself or whatever. But those insecurities, that's what I'm saying, where Satan knows exactly how to get you. So I'm getting noticed more and more. I'm starting to get talked to, and all these things start building up. And then eventually I cross that, you know, no, you know, that line, right, that we all put up, you know, because we think that, that, you know, having an affair is all about like the physical side of it, which we know it's not just that, but I did cross that line. And then that kept going and I was fine with it. I was totally fine with it. I was doing what I thought I wanted to do, um, with work. I was doing what I thought I wanted, you know, everything was great. Then I travel, I you know, do whatever I wanted to do. It was just this constant feeding of the flesh. And I was living two lives for sure, because I'd come home and act like everything was fine. And I, you know, check the boxes at home and then go back out and Mm -hmm. continue doing whatever I was doing. And so as this progressed, that's when I just, at some point during this, um, Lisa, you know, finds out and my timeline is really, really messed up. Um, not because it's just because I don't know. I mean, I kind of know a little bit, but I don't have like a clear timeline. I just know that this was the life I was living, right? Just feeding my flesh, flesh. The enemy was all about it. I, I was all about it. I was like, this is this is fine. I'm getting to do whatever I want to do. Can, you know, just keep going with this. So Lisa eventually finds out. I end up moving out of the house. Um, and in my mind, it's over. Because uh, this is the the unforgivable, you know, sin, right? Like in a marriage, this is the thing you can't do. Once you do it, that's it. You're done. And so in my mind, it was all over. And so I moved out, you know, kind of bouncing around from, uh, you know, living areas, just kind of bumming off couches 
while I was doing this. And I was just continuing to live that life. I would travel as much as I could and just continuing to live the same life that, that I was living. I was, now I look back, I mean, then I don't know if someone would have asked me if I would have even said it, but I was a hundred percent running from God. Um, you know, I, I cut people out of my life that would speak that into me. I didn't want to hear it because at this point, this is where an tactic of the enemy, this is, this is that unforgivable sin, that shamefulness. And so I didn't want to hear any of it. And I just accepted it, accepted this is the life I chose. This is the road I chose. And so as this progressed a couple months, um, you know, exact, you know, again, I'm bad with the timelines, but we still jump into this. But as this progressed, I was coming home one night or during the day, I don't remember, just traveling back from another, another weekend of just, you know, whatever, doing whatever I wanted, just feeding the flesh fully. And, um, I called it, you know, it is, it, it's my road to Damascus experience for sure. Um, driving back, not listening to Christian music, have nothing to do with, uh, barely talking to my parents, nothing to do with anything, you know, Jesus related at all. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden just, I felt, I knew God just talking to me and it is like that God smack type of thing. And I pulled over to the side of the road and I just, I didn't hear this audible sound. The clouds didn't open up. There wasn't this light burning bush, nothing like that. But I, 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 I know he was talking to me and it was a choice. And he just gave me a choice on the side of the road. And, um, he said, here it is. You can continue down, continue down the path you're taking or you can come back to me. It wasn't, you can come back to me and your marriage is going to be great and your career is going to go fine and everything's going to be great. That was, that was no promise in that it was literally You can literally walk away right now, or I'm right here. Oh. And so, um, you know, I, I broke down on the side of the road crying, and, you know, I just, I chose God. I didn't know what to do next at all. You know, I, I, I mean, I knew all the, you know, Christian things and, and things to say, but I didn't know what to do next. And so my next phone call was literally reaching out to Lisa and just asking if this, if we could work this out, if there was any possibility, if there was any way, not knowing what was going to happen and explaining to her what happened to me right then and there, um, you know, and just in hopes to see what God would do. But again, when he gave me those choices on the side of the road, it was this, this feeling of, you know, and the Bible says all sin leads to death. And, um, and, you know, we all know we die. Everyone dies. But, but what that's saying is like that eternal death, that, that life without Christ or, or eternity without God. And on the side of the road, when I felt this intensity, it felt like it was a final choice. And God's a God of second chances. Like we all know that we go through that daily, but this did feel like a finality where it was like, Hey, here's your last chance. And I'm not sure, you know, what would have happened if I walked away? I don't know. I don't know. But I just want to reiterate to people, like, there wasn't this promise of getting my family back. It, it wasn't about that. It was literally about where am I going to spend eternity, really? Like, you know, what am I to do with what's left of my life on this earth? Am I going to share the gospel? Am I going to live for Jesus? Am I going to, you know, die for him daily? Am I going to do these things? Or am I just going to feed myself until my life's over on, on earth? And so there was no, you know, Lisa's going to come back. You're going to be back as a family. You're going to one day, I'm going to give you this idea and you're going to build this unrelenting pursuit and you know, you guys are going to have a podcast and you're going to do all these things and you're going to get to speak in front of churches and, and you coach, you know, marriages and save marriages and do all, there was nothing like that at all. It was literally just me and him.
And um, I mean, clearly, there's no like you know spoiler alert, right? <laughs> We're here, um, but it was a long road. A very very long road back um it wasn't easy i still had baggage uh from my months of doing whatever it was i was doing i was still you know it, it wasn't this perfect you know god's changed everything and i walk back into my family it was even getting back into my family and and we, we ended up moving right after all this happened and just opportunities that god put in our path and even then I was still struggling with stuff and still having to deal with all these things. And ultimately throughout the whole thing, I think it was probably like three years ago, maybe now, where I finally forgave myself. And it was something I knew and I thought I had done, but there's a hundred percent shame when all this you know comes down to it. And it is, it is a point of even we, it took a long time for me to even share all this. Um, yeah you know, because of the shame, it wasn't because of what Christ did for me. Like I wanted to scream that out and show everyone, but it was this, this shame that hung over my head. And it, it was hard to even come to where we started sharing our story. And we did start sharing it quite a few years ago, um, before we even started unwilling to pursue it. And it just kind of rolled into that. Um, but it was only a few years ago that I would say probably three now, something like that, that I ended up, you know, letting that go. And because you look at your family and you see everything you've done. You know, continually, right? Like you've seen the scars that you put on your family. My kids were real young um, and uh, real, real young, right? We had not even one, right? And then, um, you know, the other two were just, they were just little babies still too. They were, you know, little toddlers or a little older than that, but they were just tiny. But you see the scars. I, I felt like I've seen these scars, right? and the scars that that i gave lisa all these things and so the whole time for me going through all this is is a reminder right and and it was a reminder of what god's done but it was like also this reminder of like look what i did you know we wouldn't be here right now if i didn't do these things or or if i'm you know putting some imaginary thing on my kids like oh well if i was a better dad I, if I didn't step away in this crucial point of their lives, like these are the things that, you know, I could have helped with, I could have done better at. And, um, you know, what we do devotions, I do devotions now daily. And I try to really spend, you know, time, time with God all the time. And I was doing devotions a few years ago and dealing with this, it just came up in my head and of, of looking at my kids, looking at my wife and seeing all these things that I've done, right. I know in the past, and seeing these scars and God literally just again, like, you know, steps down and just tells me, he's like, you can't look at it like this. You have to look at it. Gosh, you have to look at it as what he's done. Right. I know I, I can heal those scars. I can't take them back. You know, that's all downrange, like that's all done. But I was looking at it wrong. I was looking at it as like, look what I did, look what I did. And God's like, no, stop. Look what I did. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, it was just a couple of years ago into our road of reconciliation where everything's been going great and, and continues to go great. And, um, but that was the day that I finally like was able to just let go of, you know, forgiving myself really, and not staying in that, in that cycle. That's beautiful. Wow. Thank you for sharing your, your yeah. stories with us. What a powerful story of pain and redemption. There's so much beauty. And I have so many questions. I have a whole list. There's so there's so much that happened in the background there, and yeah. we can get into mine too. I do want to mention this, which is so such a powerful piece of our story too, because we did go through the entire divorce process. Yeah. So we divided up our money, our children, our time, um, the life that we had built together. We wow. 
we took the time to dissect every aspect of that because there was no desire for reconciliation on Brad's part. I had been given a divine, and that's all I can call it, a divine love and desire for reconciliation, even though hmm. that was not in my nature is what I would say. And so we had walked through this whole process. And when, after Brad had called me, um, after he'd had this road to Damascus experience, one hour later, our lawyer called and said, the papers are ready. They just need to be signed by the judge. So like, when I say that, like our feet wow. were in the water of the Red Sea, like that wow. is exactly the case. It was, it was one of those moments that even in that took a huge leap of faith for me in that moment to just say, hold on to the papers. I didn't have enough faith yet to say, get, rip them up. But I just said, hold on, because I just had this, I just knew what that road led to. At this point, we had been separated for around eight or nine months. Yeah. I knew what that, what that road led to, but I knew who God was. And I just wanted to get the opportunity to see what he would do. And he has done immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. Amen. Really, yeah. truly. Lisa, I, you know, I'm in your shoes and what's different about your story is, um, the affair was ongoing after you found out. And I know that is something that I cannot relate to because in our story, it was in the past. And so I would love for you to speak to the spouse who has now become aware of the betrayal and the, and their spouse is not willing to stop. What would you say to them in that moment that they're in right now? The best piece of advice that either one of us could ever give you is to go after Jesus. Like when, when I say that, and I know that this sounds like almost a generic answer to give, but when I say that I know the all sustaining power of Christ, Isaiah 46, four is my favorite verse in the Bible. And it talks about that. It is he who will sustain you. And I think there's such beauty in the recognition that if you have the need to be sustained, then there is a desperation there. Yes. There's this reality that your life is not going perfectly if you need to be sustained. And I went after Jesus. That is what I did. And he wrecked me in that process because there is this ability to recognize. And, and I think in, in stories like this, there's this very clear outside perspective of the right and the wrong. Mm -hmm. And and I was in the right. Yeah. <laughs> and that's kind of how I felt. You know, it was like, I am justified. I am right. And God, leave me alone and worry about him. Yeah. <laughs> and so this entire process, God had to walk me through steps of learning to obey him, even when it was not what I felt was fair, even when I felt like I shouldn't have to, even when I did it kicking and screaming, God had to walk me through obedience and God had to walk me through forgiveness. And he had to walk me through that even before that was even, like you said, during the process, God had to walk me through that. Now, when I say that there's forgiveness, cause I am no saint and I want to make sure people know that, um, he walked me through for the beginning stages of the process of forgiveness because forgiveness is ongoing, right. but he really did bring a, a book into my life at that time that talks about these um, tactics of the enemy to cause you to be discouraged and bitter. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading that book and feeling like, Oh my gosh, like this is my, this, this was my crossroads long before Brad had his of recognizing that no matter what the outcome of our marriage would be the woman that I was going to be was going to be determined in this crossroads. Was I going to be the bitter, discouraged woman? And I've seen them. And so have you, we've seen the people who've allowed their circumstances to become the, the cause of all of their angst for the rest of their life. And I've seen, and you have seen those that have been healed. Right. And so I made a decision in that moment that no matter the outcome, I was going to be healed and whole. And I was not going to be bitter and discouraged which means I had to start walking out forgiveness. And like I said, God had to teach me to obey. And in that obedience, he was building my faith. And so I would say the the answer is Jesus, right? Go all in with him, be desperate for him, mm -hmm. learn what he's telling you, allow him to change you mm -hmm. and worry about you and then mm -hmm. surrender. That would be my my advice and surrender is gut wrenching yes. because we like control. <laughs> and when you have no control, and when I say that God, like I feel like I held my marriage in my fists like this, and God had to peel one finger back at a time. That is a hundred percent what happened for me. And but when that surrendering process happened, I got to see God move 
because I wanted to have some level of ownership over our story. Sure. I wanted to be able to say, you know, there was these steps that I took or I did all the things or I, you know, said all the things. And it was really God saying like, tell me when you're done mm-hmm. <laughs> so that I can go to work. I mean, that's how I really felt. It was just like this surrendering process that had to take place. Some, one of my dear friends told me that uh, God wants to write a story that he can be seen in. And when yeah. I'm in control, he can't be seen in that. And that's exactly what I just heard in what you said is letting go of that control allowed God to really be seen as a miracle worker mm-hmm. in your relationship. And it's just so evident too, Brad, with your experience of just driving and how God met you right where he did is is a miracle of bringing you back to him and starting that restoration in the marriage. And it's just so beautiful. It's all Jesus. That's how we yeah. said in the beginning, right? Yeah. It's all him. It's not, yes. not us at all. That's great. <clears throat> Brad, I'm, I'm curious. You mentioned that there was small compromises that you entered into and they were gradual, the way that I heard you, they were gradual. And then you had this cognitive dissonance where you made things okay with what you were doing. Like you rationalized. Um, And Lisa, I want to go to you with this question. Did you see things, red flags that you chose to sweep under the rug in your relationship when he's making these um, small compromises? And if so, what were they? So I would say that our situation is unique in the ability that a lot of that deception was able to take place and he wasn't at home because there was a lot of traveling. And so, yeah, I would say that there are little things that felt disconnected or odd, but it was also because, and I associated those things with, we had just had a baby. And for anyone who's in that stage, you recognize like there's this period of time, right? Where there is this disconnect. Your every waking and sleeping moment is consumed by the needs of a little human being, right? And so there definitely was, when I look back, I feel like there was some disconnect, but I, like I said, between the travel and between that, I think in, in kind of a unique way, none of those things were, were what I would have considered red flags. And probably up until, you know, maybe days before I found out when I felt like huh, something is just not right. Mm-hmm. But I, when I say like days that I, I mean that literally, because up until then I was still in the complete, you know, kind of had this facade of like, this could never be something we would ever experience. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Brad, did you want to add anything to the, um, to the red flags or the oh man i don't know i mean i i was such a different person back then too you know like uh i think i was very good at and it's part of i don't know i was just very good at um compartmentalizing uh i'm still good at it it's just something that i i have to do sometimes but i just i feel that that was a big part of it where you know, for whatever reason, I could easily switch between, you know, two different lives. And I don't like the part about justifying. So just to go a little deeper on that, there's a scripture and for the life of me right now, I can't (laughs) think of the scripture, but uh, where Jesus is saying that, you know, if you've looked at a woman lustfully, you've already committed uh, adultery in your, your, you know, heart. Right. And so I took that for what it was exactly what it says right just out of out, kind of out of context yeah. just kind of just like took it and said well I, I know he says this and i've already done it so does it matter now if i just cross over that proverbial line you know does it really right. matter and so that was that was the scripture that i used now i know that yes he did say that of course it's in the bible but also i know that we could take our cat our our thoughts captive and what he really is saying in that scripture is the dwelling of it, right? right. The, er, the the need, the want, that true like lust that comes, you know, from the heart that just you're just desiring and constantly thinking about it. That's where you're crossing the line. You can't control your thoughts. You can control what comes into your body, right? Um, it's something that one of the things that I've changed since all this has happened is I, I do saturate. I want to and my goal is to saturate my day with jesus um that that. starts off with 
<laughs> that starts off with with devotions, even if it's something quick. If I'm have from you know pressed for time, whatever it is, but I do pray throughout the day randomly. Um, and my music, all my music is is Christian music. Whether it's you know workout music, like whether I'm I'm listening to some rap, I'm listening to some rock, whatever it is, or just praise and worship or country, whatever it is, I do only really listen to Christian music very rarely. And am I saying anything's wrong with secular music? Not inherently. No, I'm not saying that, but I know for me what I want to do. And so I want to surround myself and, and get all that I can throughout the day from Jesus. Right. And just saturate my life with that. So I can control that, but I can't control a random thought that pops in my head. But what I can do is take captive of that and, you know, not think about it, just disregard it. Yeah pray about it, whatever it is, but it, it's kind of like what Lisa's analogy with this, which I think is so cool. If you're old enough to remember, uh, for people that are watching or listening, if you're old enough to remember where you turn your TV on, it wasn't all streaming. It was literally rabbit ears and you didn't know what was going to be Yo. on when you turn the TV on and what can you do as soon as you do that, you can change the channel. And so that was kind of, I love that analogy because that is something, you know, we, you know, with, uh, with our kids, Right. Like my son's growing up and, and he's his hormones are going crazy. And, and he'll tell me, you know, like, oh, I was thinking about this. And I'm like, hey, just understand that this is normal. Like God's giving you these things. Right. Yeah. This is, yeah. you know, God's made you how you are. This is normal. Yeah. What you do from that point is is where your discipline needs to kick in and where your love for Christ needs to kick in. And all these things need to start happening. But. Yeah. Just the randomness of what thoughts pop in our head, whether it's lustful thoughts, angry thoughts, violent thoughts, whatever it is, right? Deceitful, whatever it is. But those are just human things that pop in our heads. It's what we do from that point on that really determines what's going to happen. And so I took that scripture back then for exactly what it said. Oh, I thought about it. I did it. Move on, right? Um, Instead of really, like I said from the beginning, I didn't have a rooted and grounded what I would call a rooted and grounded relationship with Christ that could withstand a storm or be tested. And so when I was tested, I failed miserably and the storm swept me away, you know? And so that's what I mean by getting in the Bible daily. My priority overall, my overall priority is Christ. It's my own walk with Christ. And then from there, now I can help lead Lisa I can help lead my kids. I can spiritually do these things. But if my walk with Christ is wrong, then everything else is going to start to fall apart. And so that's my big, like, that's the training ground, right? Because the storms are going to come. The trials are going to come. The tests are going to come. All those things are coming. They're going to come. If you haven't been in a fight yet, you're going to get in a fight. Yeah. It just happens. That's life. That's the what Genesis 3 world we live in. There's nothing we can do about it. What we can do about it is train. And that training is putting Christ first, getting in the word, praying. I I used to think it was ridiculous. I would read, was it Paul talks about praying without ceasing. And I'm like, how, what do you just walk around like a monk? Like, what are you doing? Like, how do you live life? Again, taking that scripture and just, you know, kind of not really understanding what he's talking about. Now I do. Now I know that, you know, I will randomly pray throughout the day. Um, you know, first Corinthians 10 31 do, you know, whether you eat, drink, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Like those are things that I want to strive to do throughout my day. And because of those things, that's why our marriage is stronger than ever. Mm -hmm. We didn't get back the marriage we had and I don't want that marriage. Mm -hmm. Not that it was horrible, but I don't want that marriage. Right. We didn't get, and we tell couples this all the time. We're not trying to get you back to the marriage you had. God has something so much better for you. I couldn't imagine. I, I'm, I wish we never had to go, go through this, you know, of course, but it did happen. And now I can't imagine it not happening because of where we're at now. Now, if you're out there and you don't have a testimony, that's, that's, that's amazing. Awesome. <laughs> that's amazing. I, I want, like, I want this my kids. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. This kind of testimony. I want my kids to have like this, you know, amazing life with Christ throughout their whole life. But if, if you don't have that, this you can well you can have a strong marriage without having to go through all this. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Um, but now I can't like I don't want the old marriage. I love what we have now. I can't wait for what we have, you know, in the future. I can't wait for what we have in a month. This is nonstop. It's it's continuing to grow, continuing to um, 
focus on each other, continue to serve each other, continuing to lift each other up, continuing to um, just support each other. Yeah, we're expectant for the future, if that makes yeah. sense. That's great. I have more, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on um, what you were saying about saturating your day with Jesus and your mind with Jesus and touch on the impacts of pornography and what it does to the mind and mm -hmm. having to reprogram your mind to not think that way. You know, you said we can't we can't help our thoughts that come in, which is so true. We are not our thoughts. We can observe those thoughts. Um, but I am just curious, um, what, how long did that process take for you to start reprogramming those thoughts so that they're not flooding in and you're able yeah. to capture them? Cause that's something we hear a lot is this is way harder than I thought. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's all hard, <laughs> but worth it. Um, wow. Time wise, you know, I, I'm not sure. So to back up a little, we never got counseling. Um, we never, you know, there was probably help. We had that, pastoral counseling. We did get pastoral counseling, but I mean, there was probably a lot more help than I thought there was yeah. then, or then mm -hmm. I think there's more help now. I think like, you know, even in the secular world, pornography is being looked at a lot differently. Um, now in the secular world, I will say that I think that there's still a lot of stuff that, that, I would consider pornography that they don't. Um, but the full on, if you hear the word porn, the full on, a lot of people in the secular world now are really against it as well. Um, so it is kind of interesting, like what you're saying, you know, it does change your mental uh, state. It does change the way you view uh, sexual encounters, the way you view sexuality, the way you view other humans, right? Whether women deal with porn as well. It's not just right. a men's, you know, only niche. So, you know, whether if you're a woman or a man, it does change the way of the, the perception you have for the opposite sex. Right. Um, and it's, it's something that on the surface, you're like, well, it's just, um, like sex, right? Like, it's just, this is, you know, this is just what it is, but deeper, it is a loveless environment a um you know it breeds right. hate yeah. yeah and it breeds hate and it's an artificial everything um man i cannot think of this this because i wasn't ready you know for this kind of question which is fine i'm totally good with that but um matt klein with um restore, restore community. to restore community yeah, we love matt. amazing yeah, yeah i love matt and he throws out all these statistics about this stuff but like porn is just like a regular well i think it's stronger than some, most drugs actually. And then now it's more prevalent in the way you can hide it, right? When, when I was growing up, it, we didn't have smartphones, right? Like you couldn't just- you just close your browser. Yeah, you couldn't just, <laughs> right. you know, do any of that. And so I think that it is more prevalent now, um, especially with teenagers. And then the porn industry wants to get you caught, I think as early as 12. I think that it's eight that they is have- Is it eight now? now the average, is, you know, uh, start in this world is eight. Yeah. And then once you're hooked, like it's so hard to get out of. Um, so it does change your brain and it chemically changes your brain. Like on scans, it literally changes the way your brain works. Um, so for me, steps, I didn't, there was no step. Like I, I don't have, like, this is what I did. What you, I, you did, except that, so I would say, just to jump in here really quick, that this wasn't, this was one of the reasons why there was still some ongoing things yeah. like this for years after our reconciliation. And it was a point of, of huge contention for me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, of course, this brought me back to the same emotional place every time. And so it was, there were times when I cried out to God, just let me go. Yeah. Like, just let me go. Like, I don't want to be in this pain anymore. And, and God is so faithful to like, give you what you need in those moments. Cause it was almost like, he just like, I'm not finished yet. Yeah. Like I'm not finished right. yet. And there's such beauty in like recognizing God's still working. I think that my, my biggest change really was what I started doing for Christ. Yeah. Right. Um, and I know this sounds like the blanket answer, you know, like when your kid comes back from Sunday school, like what was the, what was the, what was it about? What was it about? And it's like, Oh, it's about Jesus. Yeah. Like, it's the blanket answer, right? But 
it's so true. Um, it wasn't until I started a hundred percent, like all in, right? Like I had my road to Damascus experience. I knew God called me back. I knew he was there with me all the time and I would still mess up. And that's how I know that that's their addictions behind it. Right. It's not something, it's something that, that, you know, you sit there and you're like, I don't want to do it. And then you do it, you know? And it's, and so that's when I started really learning, like, well, no, this is an actual addiction. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't seek any help specifically for that. And well, you had accountability. I did, well, yeah, I started, I didn't have any like professional help at all, um, which I'm, I'm totally a pro professional help. Like, yeah. please, if you're dealing with this, like reach out and get help, legitimate help. Yeah. Um, I did start having an accountability partner that wasn't my wife. Um, yes, so if good. you have an issue with this, it cannot be your wife because in this realm, it is a direct attack on how your wife views herself, yeah, how she views relationship. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Oh, absolutely. And so, and I've told men this and, and we've both told couples this, that, you know, that addiction part, it's not, a, and we try to tell people it's not a reflection on the spouse. Right. Um, I would say majority of the time, uh, it's not a reflection on the spouse. Like I still found my wife attractive. I still, you know, wanted this marriage. I still want all these things. So it wasn't something that I was like trying to seek, uh, things cause I was unhappy. It was more of that addiction side of it. Right. But I did get an accountability partner and, um, and then we installed, installed uh, some protection. Yeah. Some on protection devices. on devices and things like that. And I don't know, I know that throughout that, as it started, as I started really diving into my relationship with Christ, like really like wanting to learn everything and wanting to be, wanting to be the man that God's called me to be right. Period. Um, that's when all this started to really switch and it started to become where I don't recognize the person that I was. I don't reckon, I don't, Mm -hmm. that all sin to me is disgusting. But even that, like, I don't understand how I do understand. And I don't understand how people get hooked into that. Right. Like it, it's, it is a disgusting thing to me. So I'm not drawn to that at all anymore. Um, that's a God thing. It and is. this is all God thing. And that's, that's why, a that's why, you know, it's not a, renewal. Exactly. A hundred percent. And it sounds like such a cop answer, right? Like, oh yeah, G- Jesus, just put Jesus priority. But gosh, if you can do that. Like if you truly can do that, truly, yeah. God is my priority. There's not a list of priorities I have. Like God is my priority. God's my priority at work. God's my priority with everything I do. There's not these, I have a priority here and another priority and this is rates here and all that. No, it's just one overall priority, period. Yeah. In that, your marriage gets stronger. In that, your career is better. In that, you're a better parent. You're a better husband. You're a better friend. You're yeah. a better uh man of god period like I, is rooted. yeah my identity isn't rooted even in what i do for a living it's not rooted in this testimony mm-hmm. it's rooted in christ period like that's it and so it is a renewal of the mind but if you cannot or don't put christ truly in that you know first in your life mm-hmm. then it, it's it's gonna be harder to get where you want to go yeah whatever it is And, um, so it was a renewing of the mind and we still have, uh, apps up that, that protect our phones, that protect all our phones. Uh, you know, all the kids, we still have all these things and checkpoints you want to create checkpoints. Yeah. A hundred percent. Reminders of what you really want versus what you want right now. You know, it's like that, that constant reality of we're moving towards something. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you do not give into the temporary. It's right. It's the mindset forward, you know, the eternal. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of, um, so there was, a. I always talk about this too. Craig Rochelle did a whole sermon. He's probably done a few on pornography and, you know, all the things around it. But one of them, he tells a story where he talks about, he did the sermon, got off the stage and he talked about having blockers on every device he has, right. In the electronic device he has, he has some kind of accountability to it, not to his wife, to other people. Right. And he had this uh, older lady come up to him and said, do you have such a problem with this that you can't control yourself? And that's why you need to do this. And he said, no, but he's like, I don't want that door to ever open. And so did I, yes, I did have a problem with this. I don't anymore. hundred percent. You could take the blockers off my phone and I would be totally fine. That's because I do a lot of other things. Not because I'm like, oh, I'm strong enough to not do things. No, it's because 
what I'm doing with Christ, what I'm focused on, but I don't want to take them off because I don't want those doors to ever open. And so we do have boundaries in our marriage. We have guardrails up that we set there in place to one, protect each other, right? And to protect our marriage and to also like honor our relationship with Christ. And without that, you can go off the cliff super easy. Again, you're not going to roll out of bed one day and say, I want to throw away my family and do all these things. Right. It's going to be these gradual little steps that you don't realize it's going to happen. Yeah. Right. You go to, uh, so for me, I love Girl Scout cookies, love Girl Scout cookies, especially the Samoas. Maybe that's not how you call them anymore. I don't know if that's completely correct, I think but that's whatever it is, good. that's what I grew up on. Those are my favorite. Mm. And I, when we get them, I'll get like two. Right. And then I'll go sit out or whatever. And I'm like, oh, these are so good. Then I'll grab two more. Then I'll grab two. And next thing I know, like two sleeves are gone. Like I demolish those cookies throughout. Uh, I don't even know what the time frame is. And then I feel horrible by myself. And I like, I'm like, I can't <laughs> believe I did that. Like, are you kidding me? This is ridiculous. But it's that same analogy, right? I had no intention to eat a whole box of Girl Scout cookies in one setting. Right. That's ridiculous, first of all. <laughs> no intention to do that. I had no intention in 2011 to or 2011 yeah. Yeah. to throw my life away to throw my family away to walk out on my kids like i had no intention to do that at all it was something that gradually built up mm-hmm. and at one point i looked in the mirror didn't recognize myself and at that point i was like well it's all gone it's lost anyway so i'm just going to keep going down this path that i chose yeah. no intention to do that at all and so those analogies to me like i think really help people understand that this is something that anyone can fall into, mm-hmm. yeah. anybody. But you have to put up, like, we have guardrails in our marriage. We have. When we tell people we don't watch shows with nudity. That pretty much, like, is like, people are like, well, well what do you watch? What do you watch? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll do a plug for VidAngel on that one. Get yeah. Yeah. Angel app, yeah. okay? VidAngel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, but yeah, those guardrails help us to continue to live the life that God has called us to live. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it's beautiful. Like, Ever since we put up boundaries and safeguards in our marriage, it keeps the good in our intimacy, yes. the passion, all of those things that God designed for a marriage to have. It cannot happen without safeguards because the enemy gets in and destroys all that God created to be good. And so you're speaking our language. We are huge believers in boundaries and safeguards to protect and keep the bad out. Yes. Brad, earlier in your um, testimony about like your life, you mentioned you had these insecurities, these deep insecurities that when you would go off <clears throat> on your work or you would leave for the weekend, you would start entertaining small compromises on when you would go out of town and they would lead to things. But you mentioned specifically they came from these insecurities. And as I was thinking about that, I was thinking about my life. And in our relationship, I'm the betrayer. You're the betrayed. And I'm thinking through my issues and how I had these same compromises. I had these same red flags that came up in my life. And <clears throat> initially, Adele asked me, why did you do this? Why? And I had no idea. I couldn't answer. I couldn't answer that question. I had some issues with time frames, like you were talking about. I couldn't answer why I did what I did. But over time, I've been able to look at my life and I've been able to see a couple of things. One of those is secrets. I had secrets from my past and secrets make me sick and they make other people sick. I also realized I had these really three deep thorns that I had stuck into me. Some people would call them fears, but three deep things that that really controlled how I viewed life. Like we go through life and we have these traumas and things that happen and they put a filter on how we view life. And those filters will turn into these deep rooted thorns or emotions that get stuck into me because I never want that to happen again. And so I'll go through life never wanting that to happen again. And so when I do... I end up perpetuating things through my life. And some of those are, I feel judged. I feel like people judge me. I feel not good enough. Like through life, I feel like I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good looking enough. I'm not, there's so many not enoughs that I feel. And then the, the last one is I feel like I'm a failure. And what I've really understood about men is about 98% of all men have the same, I feel like a failure thorn. 
And so those three things, I've been able to look through my life and seeing how specifically not good enough has made me desire to be good enough. And so things like porn or being able to be with someone else who speaks good enough to you can make me feel good enough. And so I'm curious, in your insecurities you mentioned, have you been able to identify what those insecurities are? Have you been able to label those, like mine's not good enough? Have you been able to label yours to see how that may have impacted how you chose what you chose? No, no, I mean, I, I think you're speaking my language a lot, right? Um, I've never really labeled them, I don't think. Um, I for sure have, it is the insecurity of not feeling good enough, um, not feeling, uh, and I, I don't know if this is an insecurity or if this is something that, this is, again, these are, the not feeling good enough, I think, is almost always going to be an insecurity. I mean, I fight that all the time. Um, am I doing this right? Am I, you know, and that goes into looks, too. And that was, I think, a big thing for me. And and then the feeling of wanting to be desired. But I look at that, too, and that was a big pride issue I had. So for me, you know, not feeling good enough. Man, that was being fed in the I was good enough right world because i don't really want to get into what i do for a living because i don't want it to like you know people to be like oh wow okay i want to hear more about that but i did go into a you know i'm in a, a first responder environment and i chose to get on to some teams that are extremely hard to get on and it's a very very low percentage of people that have ever been on these teams and i got on it i was able to get through it successfully and doing the things that we were doing then and and or continue to do now it was amazing and man it feeds it feeds a pride and i know you know it's 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 a man thing right like for sure um <clears throat> it feeds a pride it shouldn't feed the pride there's a healthier way to handle all of that stuff because i still enjoy what i do but i look at it a lot differently so i was being fed this i'm not good enough but all of a sudden i was good enough and in that environment of being around guys that are on the top of their game, it's continually to, it's a good competitive nature to be in there. But at the same time, if you're not careful, you continually feel like you're not good enough. And so you keep striving to be good enough, to be better, to be that, which inherently, if you listen to just that little piece I said, is not bad, right? Like inherently people are like, no, you should strive to always do X. You should strive to push the envelope. You should strive to do these things. So it's inherently not bad, but it can become very bad very quickly, right? And so pairing that with always worried about how I looked, always worried about if I was in shape enough, always worried about if I was good enough in that sense, right? Yeah. Now, when I went out and all of a sudden, other women started to notice me because I took it for granted, right? Like my wife, she's my wife. Like she's supposed to X, right? right? She's supposed to love me. She's supposed to choose me. She's supposed to want me. Like it's all these supposed to's, right? It's my wife. Now I know that in an unhealthy marriage, there's, well, one, yes, I guess I expect those things, but also it's something that I'm doing, like I'm serving my wife, right? I'm not, like, I'm not sitting here going like, wow, Lisa has not told me today that she loves me. Does she love me yet? Like, Lisa hasn't met these expectations in my marriage today. Like, is this a problem? No, it's not, right? Again, go back to earlier what we discussed. Jesus is number one in our life. God meets my expectations. No human can fill that role. Okay. And so as soon as we start making that a human thing, then people are going to fail. Then you, you know, fall out of, you know, whatever you're doing. So for me... There was a desire to be wanted. I was being noticed. And then I was, my pride was being fed by that and also by people I surrounded myself with, right? Like, you know, that girl's looking at you. You know, the, all these things, right? All these things that get fed like that because the driving force behind it wasn't me saying, oh, I'm not good enough. It was the enemy saying, you are good enough. Look, I'll look, show you. like she's looking at you she's looking at you they like you they think you're the best they think you could do this all these human things right mm -hmm. and that's where i fell 
And that's when I started seeing that, you know, yes, porn, when all that first started, when I first started doing these little compromises, 100%, I don't feel wanted, I don't feel good enough, all these things that are happening and feeding my pride, that all started with that too. But it started progressing really fast when all of a sudden I'm catching people's eyes, like all these things, right? Now, Galatians 1.10, right? I'm not here to... Um, God, please, please. to please man i'm here to please god right that's not my goal and so those are things that now do i still have my insecurities yes they're still there um and i i don't deal with them daily it's not something that i wake up and i'm like okay here we go you know it's nothing like that but they are in there at some yeah. you know some level but i've also fought pride i've also fought all these things and then and you fight them with truth and you fight them with truth right jesus was tempted by satan right? Before he started his ministry, I'll give you the world. I'll give you these things. I'll give you this. And what Satan's like, you know, you, you command the angels. You, I mean, he's telling Jesus who he is, right? And Jesus combats that with what? With scripture. Yeah. And so something that was huge, another thing that was huge in my life is I started to memorize scripture mm -hmm. and I start, you know, I have a bunch of, I don't know how many verses or whatever it is that I have memorized, but there's, I wanted that because I wanted them basically written in my soul where when things are happening, you know, like Galatians 1.10, you know, when I feel like I'm starting to try to please men around me, or when I feel like if we're doing an episode on our podcast, or if we're doing something on Instagram or doing something with unrealistic pursuit, and all of a sudden I start feeling like maybe I shouldn't say this because I'm worried about what might happen with men, with, you know, not just men, but men as in general, right, with humans, then I have to remind myself, like, no, I'm not saying this from a heart of anger or from a place of wanting to be stepping on people's toes or wanting to offend people. I'm saying this a place of, this is what God's put on my heart right now. And so I'm okay with it, right? Like, it's okay. It's okay because I'm not on earth to please man. Like, I've been put on this earth we all have the great commission, right? I'm put on this earth to share the gospel, to give glory to God, to show Jesus to people, to act that out, to serve, to do all these things. And so my insecurities are still there and they still reel their ugly head every now and then, right? Put on a shirt, like, I don't like this or take a picture and I'm like, Ugh, delete that. Like, are you kidding me? Is that how I really look? Things like that, right? Yeah. And I think a lot of men deal with this and they don't say anything because they're men, right? Like we're men. We're not supposed to worry about how we look. We're not supposed to worry about, you know, are we good enough? Of course we're good enough. Like we're guys, right? Like that's, yeah. you know, I, a I think it's a misconception with men. So I'm really open about sharing these insecurities and I'm sure that there's probably some more in there, but those are the big ones. And I'm very, very careful with pride seeping into my, my life because I know where that comes from. I've been there. And I know how easy it can seep into my life, especially with things that I do within my career, things that I do even at home or with my friends. Like I know how that pride can start seeping in. And so I'm very careful with that, very intentional about all those things in my life. And so my insecurities, yes, they're there, but they're not that big of a deal, I feel like, anymore. And it is my maturity and my walk with Christ that's made that possible, period. And I think that on a secular level, like people can get past their insecurities for sure. Um, a lot of things I don't understand it that can be done without Christ. Like I don't see it being done fully, fully, you know, where I can walk lasting. and say right now, right. no, not lasting. Right. Like I can walk and say right now, I have these insecurities, like in the, every now and then they do come up, but they're not hard to deal with anymore. And it's not something that I sit there and I'm like, ugh, and I just like sit in it and just accept it. And when I know the truth, I know where God has brought me from. I know what God has called me to. I know what God has called us all to. My identity is in him and I'm living life through victory, ultimate victory. And so it's, it's a different way of living, period. And so, yes, insecurities are there and I think they might always be there. Yeah. Um, but I have to remind myself and I fight it with scripture when it does come up. Thank yeah. You. It sounds like you're fighting the battle the way God designed us to fight. Amen. And that's using truth 
to combat the lies that the enemy tries to write on our heart from a very young age. And then we live those lies out in our actions. And when we have the word of God as our truth, it silences those lies Amen. immediately. That's why Jesus used scripture to combat Satan on, you know, when he was tempting him, because there's power in that. Amen. So Lisa, is there anything else that you would want to share that would be helpful for someone that is listening to this to get hope and healing out of? There, oh man, there, there's just so much that can be shared through this process. I'll just try to summarize a couple of things. I know Adele, you mentioned this too, is, is the why, right? That we always, we're looking always for a why. Mm -hmm. And I think the reality is, is there's never a why that's good enough. Right. There are steps, right? But there is never a why that will justify the action. And so there is the reality that um, whatever you know, you do have to heal from. And that is something that if you are in the middle of something like this, there is this desire within you to become a PI and you want to yeah. investigate every possible detail and you want to, and you go after any knowledge of truth. And so I, I would just caution someone to recognize that it's important to know and it's important for transparency to be there, but cautioning in the reality that whatever you know, you do have to heal from. Mm -hmm. So allowing God to guide you in that. And then also in the recognition that to move forward, you do have to move forward. Yeah. So there does come a point in your, in your journey. And if you've made a decision that you want to reconcile, you do have to change the direction you're looking. There is a process to get there, but eventually you do have to look forward. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19 talks about, look, I am doing something new. And so there is this reality of recognizing that at some point, our temptation is to always look back at what we have lost. And I would say that there comes a turning point where you have to begin to look into what God is doing and what he will do in the future. And that direction, that intentional change of direction will change your life. Yes. And that talking about the renewing of your mind, if you do have a spouse that has repented, if you are both willing to do the work, if you're having the tough conversations, there comes a point where if you are the betrayed spouse, that the direction you go, the reconciliation is on your shoulders as to how far and how quickly you move forward. So it is a, it is why we say go to Jesus over and over and over. Yes. Wow. That you do have to wisdom. heal from what you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wow. I've never heard that. It said that way, and it's so true. That is great. Thank you for that wisdom. You can't go through what you've gone through without having that wisdom that you just shared. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Wow. And then if you can just take one minute and share with people listening, how can they get more of you? How can they reach out to you? Do you have contact? Do you have websites and all that kind of stuff? That's all you. <laughs> yeah, I know it is. <laughs> So we're probably most active on Instagram, which is unrelenting pursuit underscore. We have a website, unrelentingpursuit.org. Um, we do weekly podcasts. We try to do that in season. So right now we are in a little bit of a break, but we have our podcast. You can search unrelenting pursuit wherever you listen to podcasts. If you are curious just to really kind of hear a more detailed side of our story and also steps to actually reconciling and rebuilding trust, start at episode 80, his side. Yeah. That'll give you a little bit more of a, of a detail version. Great. Great. Thank you guys so much for joining us today and for sharing your beautiful story with everybody watching. And um, wow, we just hope that the Lord continues to bless your ministry and what you're doing in the lives of other couples as well. Same for you guys. We so appreciate you. We're just over here just reveling in what God has done in, in your guys' lives and the fact that you guys continue to publicly proclaim what can be done mm -hmm. in marriages and the hope yeah. you guys spread mm -hmm. out every day. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.